All right, I've got 3.15, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming to DevOps Days, and thank you for coming to my session. Um, today we're going to be looking at Jenkins. Um, not so much as the kind of things Jenkins does or could do for you, uh, but more how to kind of uh, the care and feeding of Jenkins, how to do things within Jenkins strategies for your automation that can help you scale and, uh, and manage your automation more easily. And a lot of these uh, strategies I'm going to be talking about can help get you to that place where your Jenkins uh, instance becomes more like cattle and less like a pet. Because, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this. My Jenkins instance is a pet. Yes. Oh, okay. Sure. So, yeah, so I'm guilty of my Jenkins instance being kind of a pet. And people get in there and they uh, change things. You never know. You know, never know what's going to happen. So I'm going to be talking about some things that, that might help that. So my name is Jeff McKenzie. I am a practice manager for application development and infrastructure uh, at Insight Digital Innovation. We have a branch here in Columbus down in the Arena District. We used to be uh, Cardinal Solutions. We were acquired by Insight uh, last year. We do a number of things in tech. We do a lot of cloud, DevOps, uh, big data, AI, IoT. Um, we were partners with um, HashiCorp, Google, Microsoft, Red Hat. So we do uh, tech technology all across the board. We have a lot of DevOps opportunities and leads, and we don't have enough people to staff all those. So uh, if you're looking for something new, uh, if you'd like to talk to me about maybe an opportunity that we might have for you, I'd appreciate uh, the chance to have a conversation. All right, so how many of you have or are using Jenkins right now? All right. Um, how, how many, I assume everybody's using at least the freestyle job. How many people are using pipeline, pipeline jobs? All right, how about global shared libraries? How, job DSL? All right. All right, we're going to touch on each of those, so um, you'll be a little more informed in each of those areas. Um, so if you're interested in automation, um, you want to interact with your Jenkins instance as little as possible, right? Um, your Jenkins should be doing its thing uh, wherever it sits, should send you notifications every once in a while, um, but you don't want to be in there in the interface messing with things. You want it just to run so that you can do your uh, development work or whatever work it is you do, and Jenkins helps you out with the routine stuff. So to kind of demonstrate the ways that we can use Jenkins in, uh, and we can scale and maintain it a little bit better, uh, we're going to be looking at a, a specific case study. Uh, when I say case study, uh, I'm talking about Santa, and specifically uh, the workshop he runs kind of in that North Pole area. And this is kind of the case study of all case studies. You talk about someone who needs to scale, and that's got to be, got to be Santa, right? Because he's got to communicate with all of his reindeer, his elves, get the toys. So everything comes together on the 24th. He's got to be doing some kind of, of automation, right? So let's take a look at kind of an example of what Santa's going to be doing here. In this case, he wants to communicate with his reindeer. So we're going to start off pretty simply. We're going to create a freestyle job called Rudolph. We'll do this through the interface of your standard freestyle job. We'll give this a description. It says hello to Rudolph. We're going to keep the last three build histories on this. Under the source code management, we're going to select uh, Git for our source control management. I'm going to point to a local Git repo in my home directory, and then it's pulling from the master branch. On the build tab, I'm going to choose the execute shell build step. And then I'm going to put the following command in there, sh reindeer.sh hello Rudolph. So this tells Jenkins to run a shell script called uh, reindeer.sh, and then I'm going to pass a couple of arguments to it. And that's in my git repo. Let's look at that script real quick, see what that does. This is just simply taking in the two arguments that are passed in, assigning them to variables in the script, setting some defaults if those aren't passed in, and then simply displaying this to the screen. So we'll save this, go back to the project screen. We'll click build now, and we have a success. So let's look at the output from this. And there we have the result of the script that, it, as it's run, we, it says hello, hello Rudolph to us out there in the output. 
So this is kind of a contrived throwaway example, right? Um, but if you think about the type of things we use Jenkins for, this is not dissimilar. We've got, we're pulling from source control, we're getting a file, we're building something and or deploying something. So I'm not so much worried about what this is doing or what specific tasks we're performing, but more how you can scale out and, and more easily maintain uh, an infrastructure like this, automation infrastructure, as it goes from like one job to 10 to 100 to however many you've got. So here's our Rudolph project. Let's say we want to communicate with 10 reindeer. What would be a quick and dirty, simple way to communicate with 10 reindeer? What would you guys do if you had 10 reindeer and you needed to do the same thing for 10? We run it 10 times? And what would you, and it would say hi Rudolph each time? You could change, the, you could change that, yep. What's another way? What if you run, wanted to run them all at the same time? Yeah, 10 different jobs. You can just do a copy, right? That's our, the favorite way to scale in Jenkins is the, the copy, copy paste. And just like, how, so how many uh, application developers we got? All right, so is copying, pasting code a good, good thing? Does that work out well for you? No, not really. And so when we do that with Jenkins jobs, we get kind of the same thing. We get kind of this spaghetti automation that ties our hands, prevents us from doing what we really want to do. So there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, there is. There's one way to do this is to call, uh, use a plugin called Easy Templates Plugin. Anybody use this? Anybody try this? All right. Uh, so here's the official plugin page for it. It's got a Git repo. And the plugin itself is available through uh, Plugin Manager, so you need to select and install that. And as it describes, this allows you to take any freestyle job and use it as a template for other jobs. So let's take a look at how this particular plugin might help us scale in this instance. So we're going to create a new freestyle job. We're going to, we're going to call it Reindeer Template. We're going to create it as a copy of a Rudolph job just to get us started. We'll go ahead and change the description so it makes a little more sense. We're going to add a couple of parameters or variables so that Santa can personalize his uh, reindeer greeting. So we'll check uh, a box here for this project's parameterized. We're going to select a couple of string parameters to fill in. We'll enter our values. Our first parameter is going to be called greeting. Give it a default value of hello. Also give it a description. We're going to add a parameter called reindeer with no default value because we're going to be wanting to change that in each child job. Next, we'll scroll down to a checkbox that says allow this job to be used as a template. Now you'll only see this box if you have that particular plugin installed. So we check that. We leave our git repo as it is. We're also going to change our shell command to use the parameters as opposed to the hard-coded values we had before. We'll save that, which takes us back to the project page. And now because this is a template and not something we actually want to run, we want to go ahead and disable this. Uh, if we've got any build triggers in there, we don't want that to trigger the template itself. So we'll disable it, and it shows up as disabled. So let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and recreate our original Rudolph job using the template and see, see how that works. We'll use the same description we had before. Uh, this freestyle job says hello to Rudolph. Then we're going to scroll down to a checkbox that says use another job as a template. Now when we check that, we're given a drop-down of what template we want to select. And we'll choose Reindeer Template, so that's available. We'll save that, go back to the project page. And this shows us the Rudolph job is now implementing that template. Remember, all we did when we went in here was add a description and we picked our template. So let's go back into this job configuration and see what we've got now. So we've got our description, we've got our build history setting, our greeting parameter, Reindeer parameter, uh, our git settings are all the same, and our build step. So the only thing we have to do now is just change the value of that reindeer parameter with Rudolph, and we run it and we get the same result as before. Uh, so now Santa can talk to as many reindeer as he wants, uh, and if he needs to make global changes, he can simply do that in the template. He wants to change where that git repo is, all the child jobs will now pull from that repo. Um, 
you get that cascading inheritance going on. So this is great, right? So why don't we do this for, for everything? And that's because there are some limitations to this approach. And the first is that not all settings can be overridden. So let's say we wanted to modify that, um, that build step that executes that shell script. We wanted to tweak it in one of the child jobs. We can't. We get what's in the template as is, can't make any changes. Second, these can't be fully nested. So you, you get one level of inheritance. You get your template, and you get your child job, and that's it. It would be nice to have some intermediate you know, templates, like if we were doing similar to what we do for object-oriented programming, but we can't. And the big deal breaker is this doesn't support pipeline jobs. Uh, pipeline jobs are where a lot of the real power in Jenkins comes in, right? But this is still a great option if your, um, your automation has lots of freestyle jobs that do very similar things. This can, be, this can help you tremendously in, in scaling out and, and maintaining those. So let's turn to our next option for scaling, which are pipeline jobs. So we're going to create one called Rudolph Pipeline. And this is going to do the same thing that our freestyle job did. We're just going to do it in a pipeline fashion. So I've always disliked that description for pipeline there. I don't know what it's saying, and it's not helpful at all for like um, new users of Jenkins. So I prefer a more simple uh, definition of pipeline, uh, which is simply it allows you to write a script that does the same thing that a free just freestyle job does, only you can do it programmatically in text, in a text script that you can then put in version control. So you don't have to use the UI. So we'll add our description to this pipeline job. You'll notice this has a lot less configuration options than our freestyle build because this is all part of the script. We've got the general section, build triggers, advanced project options. Uh, the main part is this pipeline script. So let's take a close-up look at the uh, example we would need uh, to do the same thing that our freestyle job did. So not a lot of code here. Probably more curly braces than actual lines of code. Uh, let's look kind of uh, piece by piece and see what's happening here. So, and on the Jenkins site, um, if you're new to pipelines, there's a lot of good reference information to tell you how to transfer a, maybe a specific section of a freestyle job, turn that into a piece of script. So you can look all this stuff up. So a pipeline script starts with the word pipeline. We have a pipeline block that we can close within these curly braces. Um, and the first thing we want to specify is our agent. So our agent, build agent, the box we want to run this on. In our case, we don't care, so we're going to say any. We could specify a Linux or Windows box or whatever. Um, then we can set the build history to keep those last three build logs, same as we did in our freestyle job. We're just doing it here in a, a, a scripting way. We add our greeting parameter. Again, same settings and values. Our reindeer parameter. Then we add the stages block, and the stages block is just a way to uh, group commands together into sections. Uh, here we've only got one stage, it's pretty simple. We can give it a name, uh, and within a stage we have steps. And these steps are going to be the same as we had in our freestyle job. The first is to do that checkout from git pull our reindeer.sh script. And the second is to actually execute that shell script using the parameters that we specify in this job. So here's what it looks like in the context of the pipeline project. So let's run this. We have a successful build, and if you'll notice, there's a stage view here as well, which shows the name of the stage and how long it took to run. So you know, in a, in a more complex scenario, you, you might have multiple stages, um, and that's, this view is good because you can see maybe what failed in a particular stage or how long your stage took to run, so you can see if you've got a long-running portion of your script, you can narrow it down to what your problem might be. So if we go back to the pipeline, we've got another option here for definition, which is pipeline script from SCM, um, or source control management. So we can choose to pull our pipeline script from a Git repo instead of just entering it here manually, which is great because it allows, you, it allows uh, us to version control that pipeline script um, just like we would any other code. So that's great and everything. We now have this distilled into a script that we can put into source control. Uh, but Santa has a problem. Uh, he wants to communicate with all his reindeer, not just Rudolph. 
So he's got to copy this script into any pipeline project that needs it. So let's fix at least that part of the problem. So if, and this is where the global pipeline libraries come in. If we go to the Manage Jenkins page into Configure System, we scroll down, up, uh, scroll down, we get a section called Global Pipeline Libraries. And this is described as shareable libraries available to any pipeline jobs running on this system. So that means we can create shared code uh, written in Groovy, Groovy is the language of, of Jenkins, uh, that, and that code is then accessible to any pipeline script you have running on your instance. So to make this available, we click Add here. Then you'll include information about your library. We'll give it a name. We're going to call this Jenkins Lib. The default version here just refers to which branch you want to use. So. Uh, it's easy to swap between different versions of your library. Here we're just going to pull for master branch. Then we add the git repo that we want to pull this code from. So the shared code doesn't live in Jenkins. It lives out in a repo, which is where it you know, should live. So again, we'll point that to a separate git repo that we've been using that's local. Click Save. So we've got two Git repositories now. We've got Santa, which contains our shell script that we've been using, and now we've got Jenkins Lib, which contains our global pipeline library. And Jenkins looks for these scripts under a directory called vars. That's just the convention. Uh, so the, and in that directory is a file called reindeer.groovy. That's our actual script. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail. So this is essentially a rewrite of our pipeline script in Groovy. And Groovy is a scripting language, um, you know, dynamically typed, similar to Ruby or uh, Python or something like that. It runs in the JVM. Um, it's not a real popular choice, but uh, it's what you have available. Uh, and so this is even less code than our pipeline script, I think. Uh, let's break this down. So you create a method using the def keyword, so define, you're defining a method. And then by convention, you call this method, or you name this method call. Uh, rather, so, so how Jenkins finds this code is through the file name. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. And into this script, we're going to pass a, a map uh, called options. And it's you know, a simply, simply a key value pair collection we can use to get our values from our job up to uh, this code. Uh, we're in a, you know, full scripting language here, we can use try catch, just like we could in anything else. And then we've got a node block um, where we place what's actually going to run in the pipeline. So node is similar to that agent, where we pick a specific node and we can say it's a Windows node or a Linux node or something like that. So then we're going to declare two variables here, greeting and reindeer, that we pulled out of our options. We have the stage block, very similar. And here we can actually incorporate the variable name into that Jenkins script. We do the git checkout from our Santa repo and pull our reindeer shell script out. Finally, we make that call to the shell script where we can pass those variables in. So let's create a new pipeline job and see how to access this code from that shared library. So we're going to call this Rudolph Pipeline Shared. We're going to say hello to Rudolph with a shared Groovy method. That's our description here. So if we go down to the pipeline script area, we just add a few lines here. It's much shorter than we had before. Let's take a closer look at that. So the first line tells Jenkins all of this is going to be executed as Groovy. This is Groovy code, so Jenkins knows how to treat this. The second line is a reference to that global shared pipeline library. So it's saying, and the underscore means Please, anything that's below this underscore, please execute in the context of that um, Jenkins lib shared library. We create our options map that we're going to pass up to that. And then you can see it calls reindeer and passes those options. So uh, again, it's looking, it's finding that code using the file name. So it's looking for reindeer.groovy in this case. That's how it knows to link these up. So let's run this and look at the result. So first you can see that Jenkins is actually uh, loading from that uh, Git repo, the library, that shared code. So that's the first thing it does. And then second, it's loading from the Santa repo to get the actual shell script. 
Then it runs our script and we get the ex same uh, expected output, similar to what we've been getting all along. And we, when we look at the stage view, we can see uh, our variable value, which was Rudolph, uh, was used to name this. All right, so that's better, definitely. We've got a very small um, job that uses shared code. So any job that uses that shared code, we can just maintain it in one place, right? It's in, it's in version control. Still, we're kind of almost back to square one where we were in the beginning when we had all those uh, independent freestyle jobs. You know, we still have to create a job for each, um, each reindeer, right? So um, now Santa's pretty busy, as you imagine, around this time of year. He and uh, Mrs. Claus have a lot of entertaining to do and other things. Um, he doesn't have time to create all those jobs especially if he has a lot more reindeer. I'm sure he has millions of reindeer by now to reach you know, all the boys and girls of the world. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if he could actually automate his automation? He's already automated that communication with his reindeer. Well, he turns out he can using the job DSL plugin uh, for Jenkins. So um, what's, a, what's a DSL? Sorry? Or what does it stand for? Domain-specific language, what does that mean? Uh, for sp specific purpose, is that what? Oh, yeah, yeah, not the opposite of not very general. So uh, specific to a domain. So if you think, so a pipeline script is a DSL, and the domain that that language is specific to is... Um, Jenkins tasks, what Jenkins can do for you. So the job DSL plugin is a DSL where the domain is the actual creation of Jenkins job. So it's a little, um, it's, a, it's a little meta. We'll look at an example of that. So this is again available as a plugin. It's not built into Jenkins, but you can install it through plugin manager. So let's see how that works. You create a DSL job as a freestyle project. We can give a description. It's going to create all reindeer jobs. Then we go down to build and select the step process job DSLs. Again, this isn't going to show up until you actually have that plugin installed. We have a couple options here. We can pull from the file system so we can write a DSL script. It pulls from the file system. That's probably what we want to do in most cases. So then we can version control it and everything. Or we can enter a script right here, which is what we're going to do for demo purposes right now. Uh, on that page, there's a link to the job DSL API. Uh, so this is a great reference to, because when you start out, you're like, OK, how do I write one of these scripts? Um, how do I uh, create a job that has a parameter in it? So you can go to that API, and it tells you um, lots of examples on how to do that. There's even a code generator there that will, will take what you're trying to do and spit out some code for you. So that's what that looks like. It has a nice viewer. So here's the space to put our output, uh, script output. Before we do this, uh, we need to make one adjustment to our pipeline script. So we're going to do two things here. We're going to put this in source control under the name Jenkins file. That's just kind of the uh, kind of standard convention when you're putting a pipeline script into version control. You call it Jenkins file. Then the second thing we're going to do is switch out those hard-coded values to use parameters. So rather than saying, hello, Rudolph, we're going to use those parameters so we can pass in different things to this script. Otherwise, it functions exactly the same. So let's go back to our DSL project and start to build that. So to create a pipeline job or project, we simply use the pipeline job command with the name of the project. So we're going to call this one Prancer. Then we give it a description. We add our build log history. Again, we want to keep the last three build log ex executions. We add our greeting parameter, reindeer parameter. And finally, the build definition itself. This just tells Jenkins which pipeline script to pull and what Git repo to pull it from. And then it will execute that, the script that it finds there as Jenkins file. So let's run this and see what it does. So this tells us we've 
successfully created a job. So everything else we've done to this point actually executes the script, right? This doesn't really do anything except create a job in Jenkins. So if we go back to our main view, we can see that object there, but we've created this programmatically. We, we don't need to go through the interface to, to, get this, uh, to get this created. So let's run this. It should act as any other job we would have created through the interface. If we look at the stage view, we can see it was created successfully. Um, this time it's saying hi to Prancer, and that's the name of our stage here. So this is all well and good, but we still have only created one job. But the power of this job DSL plugin is it allows you to add to that de declarative syntax of actually creating pieces of the job. You can add uh, programming to it. So here's our original DSL script. It creates the Prancer job. So we're going to modify this slightly. Uh, at the top, we're going to add an array of reindeer names. We're going to loop through each of those names. So we're going to put this job creation script here in a loop. And then every time it goes through that loop, it's going to put one of those reindeer names where it needs to go in that, uh, in that job. So if we run it, we have created now eight uh, jobs, which is the number of entries we had in that array. And if we look at, the again, the main view, we see all those jobs are there and have been created programmatically. And again, these should function just like they would ordinarily. So let's pull one out, uh, comment. We'll run it and we get the expected results. So I want to do a quick recap of kind of um, how really little effort really it's taken us, or taken Santa, to get from, to get to this end state where he's got all these jobs that do whatever he needs to do, communicate with all of, all of his reindeer, uh, having all these jobs generated programmatically. So we've got our, our pipeline code, one instance that's shared across all of Jenkins, um, versioned in source control, this is in our global pipeline library, so very easy to maintain all in one place. All those jobs are going to be accessing this code. We have our Jenkins file, which is just our little basic stub of a pipeline script that's really using that shared code. One instance of it versioned in source control. And then finally, our one DSL job and script. So really to scale this out further, all we would need to do would be add a... Um, you know, a name to that array, and you would create another job, and um, that's really, that's really all it takes. Um, again, as I said, this this type of thing gets you to where you were doing kind of configuration as code, getting it to where um, where you want to be is getting to a point where all of your automation in Jenkins is in source control. So your pipeline scripts in source control. You've got shared code. You've got these DSL scripts. So if you're spinning up like a Jenkins in a container, um, these scripts can just run and, all this, and your automation is all ready to go. So that's one strategy you can use. So that is what I've got. Any questions on Jenkins or automation or uh, all these different strategies? Yeah. Yes, uh, I believe you can. Yeah, I haven't specifically tried that. I've just everything I've needed has been. So the question was the underscore in that script tells it to run the context of the library. Um, can you use multiple libraries? And I believe you can. There are ways you can pull uh, different different code out. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Have a great conference.